Hey, this is Rick Cassell from exercisesforinjuries.com. In this video report, I wanted to go through the five tricks that fight hip pain and tightness. Now, the first one ends up being posture. And posture ends up breaking down into kind of two parts that I, I end up looking at when it relates to affecting hip pain in a negative way, like making it worse, or affecting your hip tightness, like tightening up your hip flexors, or affecting your psoas or iliacus uh, muscle. So the first posture ends up being the sitting posture. So again, and you demonstrate. So with most of, with our kind of modern world and our modern activities, a lot of what we end up doing involves sitting. So it'll be sitting from driving, you know, from the work that we end up doing when we get home, like sitting for dinner uh, in the evening, sitting and and watching TV or playing on. Uh, on our electronic devices. Everything ends up being in sitting. This ends up having an effect on your hip flexors uh, and on your, your hip, all leading to pain and tightness. What ends up making it worse ends up being poor sitting posture. So if you're sitting, you have poor posture, really bad, have really bad posture. So what ends up, so your back ends up rounding out, your shoulders end up rounding out, and then you end up having more tightness happening in those hip flexors. And for a period of time, that's fine, but as time goes on and on, it ends up getting worse and worse. I look at the analogy very much like, if you squeeze your fist as hard as you can, your fist is gonna, your muscles in your forearm are gonna be fine, but after you hold that for like two or three minutes, it's gonna be painful. And it's the same thing with the hip flexors and in your hip. As those muscles shorten up and stay tight for a long period of time, they'll end up becoming more painful and then having an effect on the rest of your body. What ends up being better is being in a better posture, so standing nice and upright, moving away, good. M moving away from the backrest, nice and upright, and everything's in align alignment. Ear, shoulder, hips, uh, curve in the back is in a normal position. Now, that is better than the poor posture, but it still ends up leading to uh, lots of stress on the hip joint, uh, a, you know, shortening up of those hip flexor muscles. Now, what I end up recommending is trying to get up every 20 to 30 minutes and, you know, go for a walk or just get up and stand up and move to a point where you kind of straighten out those legs and your hips are in a, in a, in a straight line and then go back, to, go back to sitting. So try to get up, straighten out those legs and straighten out those hips every 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, now moving into the, the second part of the poor posture. And it's something that most of us don't really think about. And what it is, is our sleeping position. So our sleeping position can end up having a negative effect on our, uh, on our hip, on our hip pain, on our hip flexors, on our hip tightness. So we want to kind of look and think about our, our sleeping position. Um, because if you end up having hip pain, if you end up having hip tightness, the way you're sleeping could be making it worse. So, so I'll get Andrew to kind of lay down. So we'll use the mat. We have our, we have our, uh, our pillow there. <laughs> And so if you, end up being, if you end up being a person that really tucks in the knees and is really sleeps in that fetal position, if you look, your hip flexors end up being in a, short, in a shortened position, very much like you're sitting, sitting down. So if you lay like this and you lay like this for five to eight hours, once again, we put those hip flexors in a shortened position that ends up putting stress on the hip hip joint leading to hip pain, but then it also ends up shortening up those hip flexors, which can end up leading to hip tightness uh, and hip flexor pain. So there's two things that you want to end up doing is try to sleep more in a straight leg position. So you're going to have to have the, the, a little bit, you can't sleep perfectly straight or you're just going to fall over. So more that your legs are more straight, so you're not in that sitting position or that really that, that fetal position. So try to sleep like that. The second thing is to kind of, you can end up rolling over onto your back and sleeping on your back. And now your legs are in a more straight position. Your hips are in a more neutral position uh, and, and that ends up being better. Now for some people, when you, you know, when, if you're a sideline sleeper, 
straightening out your legs will be a little bit easier. Now for some people lying on their backs uh, is difficult depending on what pains they have or if it ends up promoting snoring, but it's something that you can end up trying in order to relieve your hip pain and to relieve the tightness in your hip flexors. Okay, going through the second tip, it doesn't really involve any kind of exercise, but what it ends up being is decreasing emotional stress. So what I find with people when it comes to their hip pain and hip tightness is they tend to be you know, people with a lot of stress. It can be emotional stress or they can be high strung people and that high, that high stress ends up having an effect on the hip pain and hip tightness, especially when it relates to the back, knees, and hip area. So just that emotional stress, and you probably have felt it in your neck or in your mid-back where you, when you're really stressed, a lot's on your mind, lots of deadlines, lots of things going through your head, your muscles end up tightening and guarding. And that ends up happening as well when it relates to your hip, your hip pain, your hip flexor, tightness. So what you want to try to do is end up addressing that emotional stress and try to decrease it or minimize it. And things that I've ended up finding that ends up helping is, you know, breathing ends up being uh, be working really well. So trying to take five or ten really good belly breaths and blowing out any tension or stress that you have that you end up having. You know, the second thing that ends up working really well is, uh, you know, doing some sort of meditation in order to kind of calm and relax your mind. And relaxing your mind and doing that breathing ends up decreasing that tension in that back, hip, and knee area. And I know if you end up giving that a go, you'll be surprised at how much of an effect it ends up having on your hip and your hip flexors. Okay, it's just me again. This is the third trick that I end up getting you, and that I'm gonna go through with you when it comes to five tricks to, uh, to do in order to decrease your hip pain and tightness. And what it has to do is the foods that you end up eating. Um, a lot of us don't realize that the foods that we are eating are increasing the inflammation um, in our bodies. And inflammation is very much like if you've ever you know, twisted your ankle and your ankle's gotten big and red, um, or if you've ever kind of fallen and hurt, and hurt something, and that area ends up getting red and, and, and kind of inflamed. But that's, what, that's what's ending up happening when you end up eating inflammatory foods. Inside of your body ends up being inflamed, not to a point where you have to go to the hospital, but at a, at a low level that things aren't you know, working properly inside of yourself, your body's not working properly. Now, the most common foods that I've ended up finding when, when it comes to affecting your inflammation and that chronic inflammation ends up having an effect on your joints, you know, ends up having an effect on your pain, and it ends up having an effect on your tissues, uh, and it ends up affecting your hip pain and uh, hip flexor flexibility. The ones that I end up finding ends up being the most ends up being refined sugars. Uh, if you uh, gluten ends up being a big one that, that ends up affecting people. Uh, processed oils. If we look at alcohol, uh, dairy, and we look at soy. Now, some of those you know might be entrenched in what you end up doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But really, what I recommend people do is like try to decrease and minimize those ones that I end up going through for seven days and see how your body ends up feeling. How does your body end up feeling? How do your joints end up feeling? Uh, how does your energy level, how, how are your tissues and muscles when you end up you know, decreasing or minimizing or eliminating those things for the seven days? So looking at you know, sugars like candies and stuff, you know, looking at gluten, so trying to minimize or eliminate any type of uh, processed grains that you're eating, uh, you know, the, the regular sh cereals and baked goods and breads, looking at the processed oils, so trying to move away from the processed oils and trying like avocado oil or olive oil, 
trying to decrease or eliminate your alcohol, you'll be surprised at how, how well your body ends up feeling when you decrease or eliminate alcohol, especially trying to cut it out for a couple days, how you'll end up feeling. Uh, dairy and soy, a lot of people end up having minor to minor sensitivity when it comes to dairy and soy. And if your body can't process, like, especially like dairy, uh, it, what ends up having is a little bit of an inflammatory response. So, you know, look at what you're eating, look at those, you know, those six things that I kind of talked about and try to minimize them or eliminate them for seven days and see what effect it ends up happening on your hip pain and hip tightness. Now, if you're looking for like a group of foods that I really recommend that you can end up eating, I would end up checking out um, best foods that slim and heal in seven days. And that's a program that I put together that really puts together a wide variety of uh, healing foods, but also slimming foods that are common to people in North America that are easy to get a, a hold of and affordable. So that ends up being a great resource where you can get more information on foods that you should end up focusing in on. What it ends up being is key nutrients, but probably more specifically key you know, macronutrients. Um, if we look at the foods that we end up eating, speci especially uh, vegetables and fruits, I mean, we think that we're getting everything that we need in order for joint health and tissue health, but in a lot of cases, we're not getting those, you know, macro and micronutrients that we end up needing. And it could be because of the soil that the food's been grown in. Um, it could be because of transportation or, or it could be when, it's, when the food has been picked uh, or harvested. It could be because we're eating way too much uh, processed food or it could be how we end up cooking that food and we're losing some of those you know, macro and micronutrients. Now what I found is and what's worked out for me is to you know, you know, add, add something to my diet when it relates to uh, you know, getting those macro and micronutrients in order to uh, you know, help when it comes to joint health and tissue health. So joint health, you definitely know like in that hip joint, trying to keep the hip joint healthy, but then also looking at the tissues around it, looking at ma uh, macro micronutrients that will end up helping when it relates to the muscles, ligaments, tendons, and fascia, everything around that. And two key ingredients that I, you know, make sure that I end up including in my diet ends up being boron and MSN. And those two end up being difficult to get when it comes to what we end up eating. So I end up adding something to my diet and it ends up being a supplement that I end up calling Joint Complex 4000. So that supplement ends up having those two key pain relieving ingredients and joint health ingredients, but also it ends up having 20, 21 other pain relieving ingredients, joint health uh, and tissue health ingredients. So take a look at that Joint Complex 4000, see if it's right for you or really consider and think about uh, you know, adding something to your diet when, when it comes to getting those uh, micro and macro nutrients that you're not getting in your regular diet because of uh, you know, a variety of, of factors. Okay, moving on to the fifth trick, and what it is is the best stretch for hip pain and tightness. And what it is is the three-way 90-90 hip flexor stretch. So I'm gonna get Andrea to demonstrate it, and with all three of them, they stem from the, the, similar, the same starting position. So we're in the starting position with ankle, knee, and hip, the front leg at 90 degrees, and the back one, hip, knee, ankle at 90 degrees. We're gonna tighten that abdominal area, we're gonna bring the arm overhead, and then we're gonna bring the hips forward. So this one ends up targeting one of the specific hip flexor muscles, and that ends up being called iliacus. We're gonna hold, we're looking at a light stretch, we're holding a stretch for 20 seconds, and then we're gonna relax off. And then we'd move on to the next one, and that's the same starting position, tighten the abdominal area, arm overhead, bringing the hips forward, and now we're gonna side bend, we're gonna bend to the side. Now the stretch is gonna go from more deeper and up against the spine. We're looking at a light stretch, we're not trying to rip apart the muscle, 
just looking for a light stretch. Now, if you end up having sensitivity in the back, you can hold off on this exercise or try to decrease how far you end up bending to the side. Uh, that might end up helping. Now, the third one ends up being same starting position, you know, tightening the abdominal area, uh, going to bring arms out front. So just below shoulder height, we're going to bring the hips forward and then we're going to rotate that upper body away from the back leg. And once again, holding for 20 seconds, looking for a light stretch. And now it'll, it'll still be in that hip area, but I'll end up feeling in a, feeling in a different way because now we're kind of targeting, um, you know, we're targeting that third plane of movement that ends up happening in the hip. So if, if you look at the hip, it can move, you know, forward back, which is what the first stretch we end up targeting. Uh, side to side, which we end up did with the second exercise. Now with the third one, the twisting or rotation, that's what the third exercise end up targeting. So we end up targeting that hip in all three planes of movement to end up helping when it comes to the hip pain, uh, any uh, hip flexor tightness. So give that, give that three-way exercise a go. What you end up doing is uh, going through it twice on each side, so each stretch you do twice on each side, looking for a light stretch for about 20 seconds. And what I would end up doing is, is just alternating back and forth with the exercises and kind of going through things. So there you go, that ends up being all five, all five of the tricks when it comes to uh, addressing, you know, helping when it comes to hip pain and tightness. So give all five of those a go um, and you know, I know, I'm really confident, I know that going through those five things, implementing those five things, will end up having a positive effect on your hip pain and tightness. You know, looking at your posture, you know, making some quick tweaks when it relates to your posture, you know, looking at your emotional stress and decreasing that, you know, looking at uh, decreasing and eliminating uh, inflammatory foods, looking at consuming you know, micro and macro nutrients, and then really doing the specific stretch that ends up targeting your hip pain and hip flexor tightness. So this is Rick Casals from exercisesforinjuries.com. Make sure to swing by exercisesforinjuries.com. Enter in your injury or pain. There's a good chance of an article, video, or an interview that'll help you overcome your injury or pain.